institutional slavery and it is feeding the educational industrial complex with complete cynicism. And you look at the people at the top end of that chain and you go all the way up to Mr. Larry Summers, for example, as the, as the head of the University of Harvard. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 these low-level students are, are feeding a very heavy food chain and they're also feeding you know, people who are doing research, people who are taking huge salaries and, and uh, working at the same time for think tanks, etc. The whole thing is, like everything else in America these days, just uh, totally corrupted by capitalistic interests of, of, of the elites. It absolutely is. And again, as you point out, this is a system that's been designed this way. We've talked about this on the podcast uh, in the past, so I hope people will look into that. But I was recently talking about how Rockefeller, the Rockefeller family and the Rockefeller Foundation, in conjunction with the Carnegies, worked uh, concertedly at the dawn of the 20th century to basically take over the medical profession. And that is absolutely equally true of education. And uh, people should look into the history of the General Education Board as just one example of that. So I think that we have to understand this is part of a very concerted and long-range plan that has been in place for generations now to basically create the society that we have now. So when people talk about the education system is in collapse and in ruin, we should just throw more money at the problem. <laughs> I think they ha they don't really understand what the problem is. But again, you have uh, a, a quite an interesting conversation with John Hancock uh, along these uh, these lines. So I'll let people take a look at that on your website. Why don't we change gears, if you're okay with that? Why don't we change gears uh, to something completely different? I wanted to bring up something that I thought was an exceptionally important story, and one that hasn't really gained a lot of attention, even on the alternative media, and that's uh, a story that was on oilprice.com recently. Uh, China is now the world's largest importer of oil what next? And basically, this article goes through the fact that uh, China has just surpassed the United States as the sing world's single largest importer of oil with 6.3 million barrels per day flowing into China, which uh, puts it just over the U.S.'s 6.24 million. Just another economic indicator that China is set to become the world's largest economy any year now. So uh, this is ex I think this is exceptionally important geopolitically and potentially um, financially as well. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about this and where what you see as the implications and ramifications of this change. Mm, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a very, very very interesting to, to realize these things kind of creep up on you. I mean, 20 years ago they were negligible and now, now they're competing with the U.S. Now, I mean, you can maybe say in the U.S. at the moment that they, uh, the, the U.S. is producing much more oil so they need to import less, I mean, which is a factor. Uh, but they all, the, the U.S. is also helping to reduce their own, own oil consumption by offshoring all industrial activities to countries like China or creating so many unemployed people that no one can afford to drive a car anymore, and so they just sit at home. And uh, then on, on, on the other side, of course, uh, you have the, the, the Chinese situation where you have an emerging middle class where more and more people are wanting to get cars and they're all jamming onto the same roads and creating massive pollution problems. Uh, but, but um, you know, the, the, the end result, I'm pretty sure, is, is that this, this gap is going to get wider and wider. And, of course, then the question really comes down to, you know, the geopolitical question comes down to is, where is this oil going to come from? Who is going to supply China? Who is going to supply the U.S.? And, of course, the U.S. has had its hands firmly around the neck of uh, of. Uh, Saudi Arabia in particular, ever since the days of the, the petrodollar, where basically there was a deal, there was a, basically a protection racket that you would have in a mafia gang, which basically says, you know, you, you buy, you know, we'll buy your oil, you pay in dollars, we'll print the dollars for nothing, and uh, if anyone comes and tries to attack you, well, of course, we've got the military bases to protect you. Literally a, a global um, protection racket. <clears throat> now, where then does uh, you know where then does China get its oil oil from? Uh, you know it's getting it from countries like Iran, amongst others. So hence you you find yourself very rapidly coming back to the axis of Iran and Syria and all the things that have been talked about on on many occasions, where where there is there's an alignment of interest, which is getting ever stronger be, between the the Asiatic countries and Russia and uh, certain countries in the Middle East who, as far as the Americans are concerned, because they don't play ball and don't want to accept the, the American protection racket, um, are so suddenly become 
hostile countries with terrorists everywhere, etc., etc. Now, I'm not saying that Iran are a, a bunch of choir boys, not by any means at all. But um, the, these are the underlying interests. And, and then you come to the, the, the next issue, which, which is, you know, what about the currency? Because at the moment, uh, all, all oil transactions, or virtually all oil transactions, are being done in dollars, which maintains a demand for the dollar, which maintains a stronger exchange rate than would exist and if that were suddenly withdrawn. <clears throat> so, so then you start looking at China and saying, well, could they actually start trading di directly with, uh, you know, with Russia for gas, if that's what they want to do, or, or with Iran uh, in, in the Middle East for oil, etc., etc., and start doing this in, in, in different currencies uh, altogether? And, and, and the answer is yes, they can. And unlike Libya, who gets rubbed out uh, because they wanted to um, <coughs> move away from the, from the dollar, or Saddam Hussein, who did the same thing, and got rubbed out uh, while America was bringing freedom to and democracy to these countries at the point of a gun, uh, I don't think they can dare play that game with China. <clears throat> and again, we come back to the, the, the very significant developments around Syria, where, where China and Russia saw a very strong joint interest in telling America that's enough. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, 